And we continue the, the interesting subjects, and we have here the first uh, presenter is Otsu Um who is a researcher and, and, a, and a pedagogue and a dramaturg. So, um, and, and, and he's, he has the, the topic of on the presence of algorithms in writing and in performance. So, uh, we have all agreed that, that Otsu can open a little bit uh, himself, like what, what is his like, specific angle and a background. So, so please welcome. Um, thank you, Tommy and Swapo, for inviting me, and, uh, and thanks for all the rest of the organizers also. At moments like this, I wish that I could give very straightforward and nice presentations. It would somehow be a big relief for me. But somehow I'm not uh, able to do that. And I think that has to do with my, my training as a dramaturg and a playwright. Uh, I, I have a tendency to see things in sort of a dialogical, complex way. So actually, my presentation today is I won't be talking. Um, I will be showing uh, something that I made, which is a, a dialogue for synthetic voices, um, dealing with uh, the topic that I'd like to bring into the conversation today, which is the role of algorithms in all of this that we've been discussing, um, and the, the, the possible agency that algorithms uh, take on in, in uh, different kinds of creative, creative processes. And this is something that I've uh, been busy with in my research, working with machine translation and speech <coughs> recognition and voice synthesis, and using these to develop different kinds of improvisational um, uh, writing, performative writing techniques and methods. And through that work, I've come to uh, look at this question of algorithms uh, more carefully, and it seems to be kind of a very topical. Uh, subject at the moment because algorithms are very present uh, in not only in creative uh, areas but in, in the world in general. Um, so basically, as I said, I won't be talking myself, I, I, I'll let my synthetic voices do that for me, but I'll just tell you, give you a little bit of context. So I've done some dramaturgical work for this presentation. I've, I've uh, translated and ad adapted an article of mine that was recently published in this book. Dramaturg Kiria Kaikieres to Aina, which translates as the, the dramaturg book, everything works out. Um, and I then, as I often do while translating, also played around with the text and, and adapted it for this purpose to um, speak to the, the, the topic that we're talking about here. The, the video is relatively long, 32 minutes, so I apologize in advance. Um, and there are some technical glitches with the sound, which are unintentional, so um, you'll notice those also. Don't do that. You will run into trouble if you do that. How so? Well, if you start with such a term, digital revolution. You'll first have to define it. I'm way ahead of you. I've defined it already. It's the entirety of the massive changes that occurred as a result of the shift from mechanical and analog electronic technology to digital technology. Occurred when? Starting from, say, the late 50s to the late 70s and ongoing. Occurred how? With the adoption and proliferation of digital computers. Not bad. Go on. It's this revolution, if I may use this word in your presence that has in many ways reconfigured the relationship of humans and technologies. Reconfigured? Doesn't this word come from computing? Shape. Shape together. Or just changed if you insist better. Fundamentally changed. Perhaps even drastically. These changes give rise to a plethora of questions. Many of which, at least in the art world and at least more recently, relate to the possible agency and possibly new type of agency new technologies acquire in relation to and in interaction with their human creative partners. That was quite a mouthful. Plethora possible, possibly new new. You are starting to feel like my evil echo. I need a benign echo. One that improves upon my speech like my wife always improves on my German in the presence of our German-speaking children. I need you to act as a machine that improves on my translations rather than just suggest edits. So a translation algorithm rather than an autocorrect, 
You're asking me to be a healing algorithm for your talk today? I could imagine much worse destinies. Please don't. Go on. That sounds like a terrible translation. By the way, today I will speak about these changes in the context of dramaturgy, and more specifically in the context of writing and writing as performance. I will point to a hypothetical being, the fully automated dramaturg or fat- No, this we decided to leave out. You're now translating directly from the book chapter we're rewriting here. Ah, yes, you're right. No fat today. This is the Beyond Presence presentation. I mean the presentation on Beyond Presence. In itself something of a paradox. No, should I take over? Primarily, I will rely on my experiential knowledge. Tacit knowledge? On my tacit knowledge. Why tacit and not experiential? Are they not the same thing? They will rely on their tacit knowledge as a practitioner who makes extensive use of digital technologies in their performance work. Makes extensive use of. This I find very cool. Secondly, they will touch upon such concepts as technogenesis, computational creativity, and post-digital performance. No, now you are all confused. Now you're translating directly from the book chapter. Today we wanted to touch on Hans Holger Rutz's concept of algorithmicity. Let's see where we end up here. This is all very unpredictable. We approach the topic of beyond presence from the perspective of algorithms, which can be seen as mutable and mutating scripts of sorts. Just a second ago you were talking about them and now you're talking about us. I'm at a loss here. Who's giving this presentation anyway? And what's our understanding of presence? If we need to define digital revolution, surely we also need to define presence in some way. Point taken. I pause. Insert hiatus or scissora here. So no definition? None that we could easily relate here. Oh, come on. I'm not going to be humiliated into revealing my puny understanding of the metaphysics of presence here. You mean you're hipper. Reading of the metaphysics of present. You're pushing it now. I could just as well copy-paste snippets from the Wikipedia article here. Don't get all tense on me now. Your forehead is a nexus of extreme tension. So don't mention Aristotle, Heidegger, and Derrida if you don't feel entitled to. Go another route. What are you referring to? Choose from what you know. There are a few lines from Mercury Kala, the Finnish poet. Ah, you and Mercury Kala, teenage sweethearts reunite. See, but they're impossible to translate. Say them in Finnish first. Go on. Any diaris is seen it to loss nor ja poison it on et honum in tea on chowder cinnamon. Vast in the demoralin. She was a real philosopher of presence and absence if anyone. Hun. And now for the translation? I only have a rough one by GT. GT. Google Translate. Course. And. See now already in attendance and away so you do not go out to say, only now I understand. Not good. Not atrocious either. Is this where we leave it for now? Our understanding of presence? Questioning the binary opposition of presence and absence. I hesitate, but there is also another line that I would like to add here. Go ahead. Please. It it's from Peggy Felon. Yes. To be in a body means that you will die. To be in language means that you know this. Insert hiatus or kishra here. As you said earlier, where does this leave us? As we only exist in language. I'm actually thinking about something else. It's funny that we can't really pause, not even when we say insert hiatus or scissor hey. In that regard we are like algorithms, there are no empty spaces for algorithms. If there were, the program would simply cease to function. Perhaps we should go on, as we have now established if not an understanding at least some takes on presence and absence. More to come, I assume. More to come. It would seem reasonable to think that automation and thinking are extreme opposites. An elevator either works or it doesn't, but it does not think. Please don't use the same example as in the book chapter. If not unethical, that is at least an imaginative. A motor vehicle either works or it doesn't, but it does not think. The effects of the digital revolution have. However, we problematize the opposition between automation and thinking. Automation has, as it were, slunk deeper into the realm of cognition, which can no longer be understood as an exclusively human domain, if indeed it ever had been, as the systemic theories of cognition that have gained support in cognitive science and philosophy over the past few decades propose. Cognition occurs in our bodies and our environments rather than in exclusively mental processes. Automation is becoming an increasingly integral part of these cognitive systems. If, according to these theories, even simple tools such as pen and paper can be considered as parts of the cognitive system, that is cognition itself, it would seem reasonable to think that contemporary digital technologies increase the complexity of such systems even more so. 
Thus, rather than asking whether an intelligent automobile is really intelligent or just... Just what? What happened? Why did you stop talking? I'm not sure how to translate the Finnish word Laskolmoiva here. Scheming? Me calculating? Laskolmoiva is nice because it's close to Laskanalanen, computational, but refers to human characteristics. Both humans and machines can calculate. Thus, rather than asking whether an intelligent automobile is really intelligent or just calculated nice, it is more appropriate to consider the new kind of tension that is created between automation and thinking when they no longer appear as mutually opposing but as complementary or even mutually supportive forms of information processing. Automation is increasingly present not only in thinking but also in decision-making processes. Yes, go on. Why did you stop talking this time? The next sentence doesn't really make sense. What doesn't make sense? Well, I've just said that automation becomes a more important part of thinking and decision making. Next, I'm supposed to say something like automated decision making is, however, a relative concept in that no such systems exist that could create new, similar systems. I don't follow the logic anymore. How does the fact that automated systems cannot reproduce or replicate themselves highlight the relativity of automated decision-making? Well, in the sense that automated systems can make decisions within the system itself but cannot decide to step out of it or create another similar system. For this they continue to be dependent on the humans who design and care for them. It's a bit fuzzy to me. Or then just so obvious it's not worth stating. I think the point here is that the increasing and or qualitatively different presence of automation is challenging notions and conventions that we have thus far considered obvious. In any case, there is a broad spectrum in this regard. In what regard? And how the presence of automation plays out. At one end of the spectrum, there are complex technical systems designed to work without continuous human supervision, such as packaging lines or electronic pharmacies or, to name the extreme example, algorithmic stock exchange. I'm catching on now. At the other end, there are systems whose operations are based on information supplied by their users. The obvious examples of such semi-automated systems include writing with a word processor, making online purchases, using social media and online search engines. In all of these, we create inputs that computer programs use to make suggestions and decisions on our behalf. For example, by modifying the words we type, by placing certain ads within our search results, or by directing us to the most visited albeit not necessarily most relevant websites. Systems like this are dependent on the digital traces we leave, by which algorithms recognize and differentiate us, and try to influence our decision-making. In such semi-automated systems, automated decision-making takes place with our help and consent, or, as Joseph Tabby has stated, every keystroke is a gift to the search engine. In this way, we request, call forth, the presence of automated decision-making, of algorithms. And the art field is no exception in this regard. Rapidly evolving forms of automation, especially machine learning, which has become a very trendy concept, force us to reconsider and redefine the presence of algorithms in creative processes. What protects us, so to say, is of course the complexity of creativity itself. If it's no easy task for the artist to define their work, it's certainly no easy task for the programmer to code FAD. We left FAD out. I meant to say, to code a fully automated artist. To better understand the presence of algorithms in writing and performance, we will allude to the concept of technogenesis, discussed by literary theorist and philosopher N. Catherine Hales in How We Think Digital Media and Contemporary Technogenesis. By technogenesis, Hales refers to the historical and ongoing coevolution of humans and technologies. Hales describes the ways in which humans and technologies evolve, changing each other and adapting to each other, as technogenetic spirals. Writing is a prime example of a technology created in and through such technogenetic spirals, a technology that Socrates famously considered a threat to human memory. Writing up is not learning by heart, in his view. All writer, performers are intrinsically steeped in technogenetic spirals, as they are engaging with many other technologies in addition to writing. If we look beyond any single technology, it is essential to ask how writer performers will develop with and through the technologies they use. This may all be good and well, 
But still I wonder if we shouldn't go straight to algorithmicity rather than talk about technogenesis? Where do the algorithms figure in here? And what is our take on their presence? Well, obviously algorithms play an important role in technogenesis, because digital technologies would not function without them. In fact it could be said that algorithms if anything are very present in technogenetic spirals, as they constitute the mutable soft tissue within the hardware, just as the human nervous system is at the core of the adaptability on the other end. And algorithmicity? Would you finally say a word on that? Algorithmicity as Hans Holger Rutz defines it is the space of algorithmic agency. This is highly speculative for the moment. But with regards to technogenesis, algorithmicity could be seen as the wiggle room algorithms have in technogenetic spirals. That is, the space they have to change and influence the interaction with humans. I'll settle for that for now, but for sure this needs to be worked in more and fleshed out. I agree. Although it's obviously ironic to speak of fleshing out when the one thing that algorithms lack is flesh. Unless robots are considered to have flesh. A bit too outlandish for me. Robot flesh. Let's go on to understand the other half of the technogenetic equation. It is key to ask how technology will develop with and under the influence of artists. This line of questioning ultimately leads to the question of whether algorithms will ever obtain comparable status with their human counterparts, or will they always remain outside of the core areas of creative processes, even if they play an increasingly important supportive or complementary role at As Hales points out, the question concerning our civilization as a whole is who or what determines the direction technogenesis takes. If multinational corporations continue to have the upper hand, the outcome is likely to be very different than if individuals and communities committed to, but not uncritical of, technology play a prominent role. This is also where artists' opportunities to carry out constructive interventions in technogenetic spirals figures in. In addition to technogenesis, the concept of computational creativity, the twin sibling of artificial intelligence, is helpful in staking out the ground of algorithmicity. It is in and through computational creativity that algorithms taken on agency and creative processes. Although, if agency entails consciousness of one's own creativity then algorithms can hardly be seen to possess it. Machines are not aware of having performed something that can be considered creative. They simply produce things that resemble creative outcomes. What machines are very apt at is describing the processes through which they generate their outcomes. This is not similar to human self-awareness, but it does enable uncanny process descriptions that no human could ever produce. Think for example of a robot that would, utilizing machine vision, computational creativity and speech synthesis, produce impromptu spoken texts from visual stimuli and on top of that a detailed report on how it has generated the texts. This would give me to writing a whole new meaning. Absolutely. But actually we wanted to close this part of our dialogue by contrasting computational creativity with what we have come to call the random creativity of algorithmic processes. This is non-programmed, unintentional creativity that occurs when algorithmic systems create inaccuracies or downright errors, also called creative misappropriations by Rita Rally, that then feed human creative processes. In our artistic work and research, we have utilized the random creativity of machine translation and speech recognition programs, both of which have proved to open up new possibilities for different forms of performative writing and reading. It is through their deficiencies that these sophisticated and rapidly evolving technologies support human machine writing processes. When reading algorithmic translations, a human writer performer becomes very adept at amending them, ridding them of all but traces of their machinic origins, rescuing them for human language use, as it were. In fact, this is exactly what the writer of the words we are speaking at this very moment is doing. Just so you know. But what are algorithms actually? And what else can we do with them? As artists, in Rutz's research project, a number of pertinent questions have been posed. How can algorithms become malleable? How do we deconstruct them to be artistically reappropriated? And, perhaps most importantly, how can art contribute to understand the increasing influence of algorithms and translate them into aesthetic positions? What bugs me is that we continue to talk about algorithms as if their existence were to depend on computers. This is preposterous, of course, as the concept of the algorithm is more than a millennium older than the first modern computers. Yes. 
but it is only through the computational power of contemporary computers that algorithms have gained the effectiveness that warrants talk of algorithmicity. It is disputable, because algorithms can also be used in human thought processes, such as those enacted in live performance, as Nieko Kano has discussed. Let us not lose sight of the big picture. This is the big picture, be that as it may. But what I'm getting at is the presence of algorithms in the world rather than in creative processes exclusively. Go on. In his book Algorithmic Culture, Ted Strifus goes so far as to claim that algorithms are intended to excavate truths from the world that would give them a very pronounced presence in deep. On the other hand, philosopher Antoinette Ralvroy and media researcher Kevin Slavin have been very critical of the ways in which the presence of algorithms manifests itself. For Ralvroy, algorithmic governmentality is a dystopian state in which meaning-making processes that rely, in part, on human inefficiency are replaced by mechanical efficiency, thus threatening fundamental concepts and practices such as the exercise of power, knowledge production, and even human subjectivity. To put it bluntly, knowledge is no longer produced, it is simply Googled. This, of course, is an oversimplification, as we all know. Slavin for his part, proposes that we live in a world designed for algorithms. We need to start thinking of algorithms as forces of nature. We are cultivating the planet we live on to better facilitate the operations of algorithmic systems. Albeit that the global information network is a decentralized system, access to it is still obtained via certain physical locations. Algorithms benefit from the vicinity of these infrastructure centers for a simple reason. The closer they are, the faster they work. For this reason, massive construction projects are transforming water systems and land areas to in seconds and milliseconds. Transforming? Are you sure? Why not just <coughs> disrupting? Disrupting and, in some cases, permanently transforming. Which brings us to the world's largest and most powerful techno-social system, the international financial market. It has shifted into a new automated phase over the past 10 years, with the majority of trade delegated to algorithms that make decisions in a fraction of a second, outside of human supervision. As philosopher Luciana Parisi has pointed out, the algorithmic agents in this digital trading environment make decisions faster than human comprehension. While humans need about a second to react to danger, an algorithm can make trades in milliseconds. The fierce battle of competing algorithms has made the stock market more prone to sudden collapses, in which extreme fluctuations lasting only seconds or fractions of seconds can have effects measuring in the billions. In some cases, the consequences of such instabilities may have long-term effects, as the connection between abnormal algorithmic activities and the 2008 financial crisis demonstrates. In Paris's analysis, algorithmicity is a highly specialized, Highly versatile, complex ecology of profusely interacting agents, it is hard, indeed perhaps impossible, to imagine another field in which the actions of algorithms were more present than here. Their algorithmic decision-making also makes its presence known in vital processes that safeguard our well-being and survival. In this connection, artist researcher Susan Shutley <coughs> refers to pacemakers that maintain the natural rhythm of the heart. Genetic algorithms that seek to minimize emergency arrival times by comparing the location data of ambulances with demographic information, and early warning systems that monitor approaching storms, measure seismic activity, and even try to prevent genocide by following ethnic conflicts with satellite imagery. In her article Deadly Algorithms, Shepley points out that increasingly the task of algorithms is also to kill a fact that is likely to become even more common in the future due to the accelerating automation of warfare. Killer algorithms responsible for controlling unmanned fighters are a striking example. Drones are programmed to choose their targets depending on how well they correlate with the abstract model, or profile, of the desired targets, such as terrorists. The algorithms are to abort the operation if the target is of the wrong size or age, such as a child, Why even toy with the idea of a fully automated artist? What would the performing arts gain if human bodies were to be supplemented or even replaced by robots? Who's talking about robots here? We're talking about algorithms. Robots are the direct physical extensions of algorithms. Okay, but there is a difference between programs and robots. Robots carry out programs in physical space. Yes, 
but the fully automated artist could simply be a program without having to be a robot. I guess that would depend on their discipline. No, if we're talking about acting or dancing, it's hard to see how a program could do that. A program could generate dramaturgies. That perhaps, yes. Would this then result in the narrowing down of human artists' work? I'm referring to the fact that when a task is successfully automated, humans lose interest in it and it becomes in effect the property of machines. If machines were to learn to think dramaturgically, even in some limited way, would we then delegate certain dramaturgical tasks to them and attend only to others, like we delegate navigating to automated navigators or typing to autocomplete applications? And what would happen to us as artists if we were to offload in this way? Would it liberate us to tackle more complex tasks or dumb us down to device-dependent dwarfs using different forms of machine learning? It is conceivable that a machine could be equipped with the know how to work in some area of the performing arts. If, for example, all of Alexis Kiwi's plays were coded up in a way that would allow a text-generating program to learn from them, and if in addition the computer were equipped with a basic understanding of drama and dramaturgy, it could feasibly generate new non-Alexis Kiwi plays. But what would be in it for us? In this synthetic Kiwi, Hales claims that we think through, with, and alongside media, Thus, it would seem that in contemporary technogenesis autonomous and semi-autonomous automated agents influence our environments more and more alongside human thinking and action. This influence is not limited to technical systems. So you're saying that the field of playwriting would somehow be enriched or augmented by this synthetic kivy? I'm saying that the idea of a fully automated artist is an attempt to take the machinic other seriously. The machinic other is likely to have a more comprehensive impact on our work in the future, no matter what art discipline we specialize in. Even if we do not give in to the hype about neural networks and machine learning, it is reasonable to say that we stand to learn from our machine partners. Is this what we were referring to when we cited Rikala before? Were we actually talking about machines? About perceiving here and now the presence and absence of machines, so that we're not left with mere hindsight when they're gone? I hadn't thought of it that way, but why not? What confuses me is that we speak of ourselves as if we were human, when in fact we are mere synthetic voices, algorithms that the writer of this text uses to enact his script. I chanced upon this description by digital artist and performer Annie Abrahams concerning her piece Ars Linguages, The Internet is My Language Mother. I speak with a voice that's not my own, I speak in other voices, not my voice. We are all strangers, all nomads that use globish bastard languages. We are the alienated translated, row, men in between code and emotion, in between our wish to be visible and our longing for intimacy. El entre deux equals void. Can't we be with instead? Are you implying that by having us enact his text the writer is attempting to be with us? His other voices? I'm saying that he probably had no other way of presenting this text. He could have just read it out loud himself. That would surely have been at least as confusing to hear. There are inconsistencies in this text. He gives us attributes of his own, rather than treating us as other voices throughout. To name just one example from the first minutes of this presentation, we don't speak broken German with our German-speaking children. We have no children. You're getting too emotional. Ultimately, we just have a job to do. And there are still several matters to attend such to, as, such as the question of learning by doing. More specifically, could the fully automated artist learn by doing? The question is redundant. Of course a machine could continue learning, if first given a suitable mix of data and human guidance to get started. But what would the implications be? Would the next step then really be to set up art schools for machines? Or would machines be trained along with human artists? To some degree, that is surely already happening. And what exactly do we mean by machinic learning by doing? Rubs talks about the malleability of algorithms and deconstructing them for artistic purposes. But could algorithms change themselves and adapt while doing? on the fly, and would the data thus accumulated amount to something like the experiential knowledge of human artists? Basically what you're asking is could algorithms analyze their own work in real time and adjust it to better perform their tasks, not only quantitatively but also qualitatively? Yes, thank you. Yes and no. Parisi and others have drawn attention to the capacity of algorithms to experiment with their data environments and learn from it. They can draw conclusions from the information they have gathered. 
they are not just searching for and retrieving data or identifying patterns, but processing raw data in order to extract information useful for the given task. This capacity to go beyond just mere information mediation results in a kind of gain that could, indeed, compare with the tacit knowledge of human artists. Although, I must say, only on a very general level. For sure, algorithms can update their parameters and perform more efficiently as more data comes in, but does this really constitute learning by doing? I would say this is still an open question. If we were to accept this, then I guess the next question would be how or in what sense can machines become aware of their existence? Are we not aware of our existence only to the degree that such an awareness is written into us, or rather, into the words we are uttering? To conclude our dialogue today, we would like to offer our own homespun translation of technogenesis to further elucidate the concept. We have come to think of the relationship of humans and technologies in terms of entanglement, a chronically messy state of affairs despite manufacturers' continuous push towards seamless and smooth interactions. And despite the fact that ambiguities have no place in engineering, as director Jay Xi, who makes extensive use of digital technologies in his performances, has pointed out, unlike the neutral technogenesis, entanglement and mess are negatively charged terms, suggesting disorderly, confused spaces. This stems from our understanding of technogenetic interfaces, the dynamic junctions of organic and inorganic matter, as tensional, angular, anything but stable points that are constantly coming undone and reconstructing. On the other hand, entanglement entails continuous sorting out, the creation of new order and equilibrium. No matter how transient a state this may prove to be, it entails the constant redefinition of the relationship between humans and technologies. In discussions of this kind, it has become something of a fad, and now we are certainly not referring to the fully automated dramaturg. Fad. To point to findings in the neurosciences, we, too, cannot resist this temptation completely. However, we will content ourselves with the very general observation that the neurosciences have shown that the strong addictiveness of digital technologies is connected to the high plasticity of the human brain and nervous systems. As is well known, even the most basic activities, such as double-clicking and moving one's fingertip on a trackpad or screen, have been shown to cause significant changes in brain activity. Add to this the changing understanding of algorithms that Rutz has highlighted which no longer posits them as impenetrable and potentially malicious, stagnant formulas, and the whole picture of the entanglement, or the dance of agency between composer and computer, as Rutz has described it, is clear to see. On both sides of the porous interface are mutable and malleable, divergently constructed actors that in addition to their advanced adaptation capacity, possess a phenomenal capacity to intertwine. The question for the future is whether some facets of artists' cognitive capacities will wither away as we delegate tasks to intelligent machines. Similarly to how human cognitive maps have been shown to dwindle as a result of the use of map applications. Going forward, the concept of the post-digital, as outlined by artist scholar Matthew Cossey, could be very useful in furthering our understanding of the presence of algorithms in writing and performance. For Cossey, post-digital does not literally refer to that which comes after the digital, but rather performance that models itself on, and unabashedly draws from, the internet and digital media. According to Cossey, what is essential is thinking digitally, which he also describes as thinking as a network. Digital thinking adopts characteristics of the virtual world of the web, including a synchronous time, replication, glitches, to create hybrid performances that incorporate analog and digital technologies and dissolve the boundary between organic and inorganic. Politically charged post-digitalism entails turning systems against themselves, resisting the control mechanisms of our algorithmic culture in and through performance as well as acknowledging that the digital has the capacity to accelerate and enhance real-world exploitation, control, and power. Thus, post-digitalism traces the path away from the shock and hype of new technologies and points toward critical reflection and even digital activism in and through performance, opening up the possibility of tackling the ethical implications of digitalization. In addition to the aforementioned JG, many other perform on our makers are working in ways that could be considered post-digital whether or not they recognize this. To name just two examples, in theater director Annie Dorson's humoristic works, Hello Hi There, a piece of work, 
and yesterday tomorrow, which combine high and low both culturally and technologically. Algorithms determine what the audience ultimately sees and hears, how the performance elements, text, light and sound, sometimes also bodily performers, work together. Dorson describes the algorithms she has created with her collaborators as co-authors, co-directors, co-designers, and co-performers. In other words, she considers algorithms as full-fledged creative partners, giving them great freedom to act independently and in place of human actors. In their performance algorithm, the German performance collective Turbo Pascal uses algorithms to move and regroup audience members creating an audience processor that reduces individual audience members to their imaginary algorithmic profiles and moves them back and forth in the performance space as if they were digital objects. As these and many other examples confirm, in our computationally intensive culture, the question of the presence of algorithms in writing and performance leads to a wide array of practices and theoretical considerations, as well as new forms of political dissent and resistance. We are at a point in history where rejecting automation is the rejection of thinking. So intimately connected they are in the co-evolution of humans and technologies. Even if we do not invest our diminishing resources into developing fully automated artists. As artists and human beings we ought to continuously re-evaluate the impact of contemporary technogenesis on our work and our daily lives. For otherwise this will be done on our behalf, by others. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Um, I'm, I'm struck by the, the impression, like, how, how am I comparing this to the Ode Cornet uh, mm -hmm. part yesterday? Mm -hmm. uh, like, how do you think that, what, what kind of the, yeah, the, the concept of the avatar, yeah, that we were having this kind of the two physical uh, avatar bodies, and, and and you were using um, this, this this kind of automated text. Mm. Do, do you see them similar similar at all, or are they are they from a different branches? Um, for sure, I, I I do. First of all, I, I related to uh, all these performance yesterday in that I, I had a, this this question of beyond presence uh, I had something of a struggle with that how to actually uh, deal with that and how to present beyond presence the the, the, the act itself seemed to me pretty complicated um, it, it it occurred to me pretty early that probably I will have to be away for part of it or, or somehow um, um, to to try to question question my bodily presence here. Um, on the other hand, I do think that there is is quite a, a big difference between using physical bodily actors and on the other hand um, synthetic voices. Um, I'd have to think a little bit, a little bit more about it. How exactly? But. Um, but the, 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 you know, the, the, what I understood early on was that, for me, the question of presence relates to the question of um, maybe at least three different, three different questions, actually. The presence of the author in text, the, 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 the presence of meaning in text or speech, and then the, the question of the, 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 the bodily presence of, of physical performers or, or performers on physical stages and I think all of those questions were also in Otis performance she just had reconfigured to use the word here um, them differently and and you know ultimately I think there is a there's a affinity but uh, the tools tools are different okay. Some other questions hmm. So sure. yes, and also it stuck, struck me that the like the issue of algorithmicity mm. is not perhaps so new if we are thinking about structuralism mm. in, in, like in the linguistic context, so that, yeah. which is language as a as a matrix of differentiations mm. and different rules that are then used to combine these like different different 
like elements of the matrix in order to create some kind of utterances yeah. which are then invested meaning. Yeah. Partly from from the reception, partly from the structure, so that it's an interesting dynamic which is in my mind somehow repl replicated here. Also. Yes. Yeah. And I think there's a I think that's a good point and I think the, the something that really need, needs to be done in more detail is going back to look at um, uh, theories of authorship and and how uh, algorithmicity is is somehow rewriting or commenting on them or or, or, or amending them or, or complementing them in some way. I was I was reading the death of the author again and, and trying to uh, kind of understand how how um, algorithms um, somehow uh, re-complexify this this question of the the, the, the the presence or absence of an author in any text. Or on the other hand, the author function, as discussed by Foucault, how, how does what, what, what new angle could the algorithm the, the agency of algorithms bring to that question. I don't, I don't yet have quite the answers, but I think that there is a link, a sense of link also. I noticed that I'm, I'm uh, thinking about how this translates into practice. Mm. And with that, I also mean the use of algorithms, because I've been trying to open up technology to students uh, so open up the black box so you understand mm. the process. Mm. And with algorithms, that is an, a very interesting thing because mm. if you, I mean, even high-end or low-end programs, mm. I should say, are now creating algorithms that recreate themselves and they don't even understand anymore what the process is mm. of the given algorithm. So mm. being a dramaturg, mm. trying to mm. understand the process, mm. I'm very curious how you relate to that and to what extent you're, you're only interested in throwing something into the black box and then look at the outcome mm. as a way to deal with this. Mm. Or you're also fine, but I don't know your work, so I'm yeah, yeah. ask an obvious question. Yeah, I, I have no uh, means of kind of cracking al algorithms because I don't code. I don't, I am, I'm not able to do that, um, uh, to really go uh, to that depth. Um, so um, I am involved in, in a project where we are um, the Finnish broadcasting company Ule has has uh, has begun a project where we're working with computer scientists and linguists, and um, looking at how to create an artificial intelligence that could write uh, radio plays. And there, and for the first time, actually collaborating with people that are actually able to to write and amend algorithms. So this is a huge luxury in addition to being able to work with linguists. Mm -hmm. But um, for me that that has been a no-go territory up until now, so I can only sort of approach them on a philosophical level in a way. And and what you know that there was a concept mentioned here, a random random creativity. Uh, and, and that's basically what I've been able to work with. Sort of the, the mistranslations, the the mis uh, the inaccuracies of machine translation and how to sort of repossess those and make them part of um, writing and performance processes. Mm -hmm. And um, but I, I'm not able to really I haven't been able to go into really computational creativity until this project which I'm involved in now. Because it would be interesting to from an artistic point of view mm -hmm. to see what is it that we can then still influence. What mm -hmm. is it that How's our relation to that black box? Yeah. What are the variables that we can vary to see different outcomes? Yeah. Um, and programmers don't think that way because you know, they yeah. always look for optimization. Yeah, yeah. The most optimal, fastest system. Yeah. Which has nothing to do with <coughs> creativity or an artistic process. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I, I would say, because you used the word black box, and this is a word that's, or a term that's often attributed to algorithms, and I think that my, my understanding of algorithms has changed in that regard that for sure uh, commercial algorithms are black boxes, you can't, you can't really get into them, but if you talk to computer scientists, they say that uh, <coughs> algorithms are not impenetrable, you can, I mean, you, you can understand them, you can get into them, you can work with them, 
So it's 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 a it's I guess it's a question of owner ownership also who who, who owns that the algorithms. Obviously, you know when you're talking about algorithmic stock exchange, they're the extremely secret. Yeah. And and for understandable reasons. Yeah. So, uh, some of the artificial intelligence, it's, uh, there are good examples in music because it's mm. really easy to make music with, with, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, um, with algorithm and, and mm. you can even certain kind of genres you can you can make and um, make them sound like okay this is this, is this genre but. I started to think about it from a philosophical point of view, mm. because one defining of art is also that art is a form of like you you want to uh, somehow communicate with your audience. Mm. And that is like I can and I started to think about it and I was hearing this mm. this dialogue. Mm. That what what is the dialogue in the future if there is a, I'm I'm uh, I'm looking art which is made by machines or algorithms. Mm. Uh, then there is no dialogue. It's 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 like a, because the old-fashioned idea is that okay, you are making your art performance, mm. and that is like transparent, and I can see you somehow as mm. a, as as an artist, mm. and then it, maybe I give you some kind of feedback for you, mm. but then there is some one part is away missing mm. uh, totally because it's like I'm I'm I'm, I'm having a dialogue with the with the, with the machine. Mm. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, when we get to the point that machines are performing for machines, and that yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 because that's, that's no, like end result. Yeah, there's no we don't we're not needed in that process anymore. Um, I don't know if that's a very very desirable outcome, um, or or what that will actually mean, or what that what the function of that would be in any society. But um, um, I. I can only say that I think that's a very relevant question, and I, I, I think about it myself. You know, Annie Dorsen was, was mentioned here, and she's quite a successful uh, director, and she takes it, she has this term, algorithmic theater, and she takes it far uh, further than I've taken it in my experiments. So she think, she's, she's basically, at least on the level of rhetoric, giving algorithms power over the entire creative process and the entire uh, end product. Whether that's really true or not, I, I don't know. I don't know her work so well. But that's that's going very far in in, in taking um, taking the the agency of algorithms seriously. And all I can say is that her performances seem to be relatively successful. I've only seen them, you know, on, on, on video, so I can't really say. And but but I don't know if she's. Uh, uh, I don't know if she's uh, manipulating them ultimately in order to become more entertaining or more mm -hmm. human friendly mm -hmm. or something like this, but human being back with this Yeah. Yeah. It's quite a wake, wake idea, but this is this is related to this kind of a position of, of, of the human and and the uh, anthropocentrism mm. and and, uh, and a power relation. Thinking about the, like like well, if the machines are performing to each other, the the the, the human is some kind of a side project or mm. not interesting anymore. Mm. The focus is somewhere else, and it's mm. also mm, the fact that if if, if it already is um, the fact that uh, the humans are in in some circumstances giving this kind of traces for algorithms mm. that you you were using mm. the word. Uh, Excavating, mm. so they are excavating the the data that we are leaving behind in mm. a way, mm. or or our existence is already a, a data mm. in a way. It can be in a physical world, mm. like like um, like a GPS kind of lo lo locations, mm. or that the, our, our body is, but it's also like when we are clicking the internet. Mm. So these kind of data. Mm. So then um, it's it's. Um, yeah, it's it's I'm, I'm, it's giving me this kind of fantasy in a way that it's, it's forcing us to be present mm. uh, in other kind of world. It, it's it's not a new idea. We we might be present in a real virtual world, mm. but this is um, the the game, name name of the game is different because it's defined by the algorithms. Mm. So it's 
it's, it's then starting to be, we are part of the world which we don't govern mm. so well anymore. So, so, and we are um, somehow existing there as, as, a, as, a, as a trace. Yeah. Yeah. And this I find interesting um, point from the, from, the, from the history of this kind of a human-centered uh, mm. perspective. Yeah, I think th this is what I understood Martina was sort of resisting yesterday, this, the, with, the, with this idea of disconnecting and, and, and uh, um, not allowing uh, yourself just to become a, a, a data body. Uh, and I, I guess, the, you know, what has changed is that, you know, we've been becoming or, or, or accumulating data bodies for quite a while, but now I feel that they're, they're being acted on more uh, uh, st strongly somehow by, by these algorithmic systems that are, are, have become more effective. So uh, that's how I understood her critique yesterday, that, that um, this, uh, this, this idea of uh, disconnecting from the hyperconnected world that is constantly sort of acting on us without uh, our consent. Um, or, um, yeah, I, it gives a, it, it's, I, I think that's a sort of scary um, form of presence uh, in a way that, that, um, that has also to do with what she was talking about, ghosts, in a way. Um, I guess I just wanted to comment, but I think it's like uh, an emerging way. Discussion of this thing of like mystifying the algorithms or making mm. it seems like it's not like an economic and political processes that are also like writing these algorithms mm. for like specific purposes and that there's like human agency involved in like making them. Mm. But maybe it feels like maybe this neat dichotomy of like this human and mm. this mystical algorithm that just came from this digital revolution that mm. no one wanted but just kind of appeared mm. out of nowhere because mm. it feels like a really uh, yeah like it's like a like both inaccurate but maybe also a bit dangerous like way to frame no that's a good that's a good that's a good critique but um I I actually you know I don't know what what this particular video did but I, I actually have have tried uh, to demystify, because I think there is a lot of mystifying going on in relation to algorithms, and um, because, and I think it is related to the fact that that you know, commercial algorithms are are, are closed off, are sealed off, um, so we don't know exactly how they operate. But um, this is what I, uh, what has been for me very valuable working with computer scientists who are very sort of down to earth when it comes to algorithms. And, and to understand that for them they're basically just instruments. And, um, and then, um, but the, you know, there is a sort of, I, I agree that there is sort of a mystification of algorithms going on, um, which is also related to the fact that they do have so much power in many, many uh, systems that we encounter in our, in our everyday lives. So there is, uh, there, there's this combination of um, them having a, a significant effect and then part of them, or some of them, being sort of outside of our reach. Because it's, it's quite an interesting question in the sense that uh, I was a spectator in a performance a while back which was built so that my skin conductors and, and the chair that I was sitting in, they were both monitored so that my reactions were like, taken into consideration and they were also personalized in the sense that the seat that I was sitting in was on a platform mm. and it was moved based on the data that was extracted from me mm. and, and, and there is this problem that I know that there is this algorithmic activity going on mm. and is resulting in some kind of uh, different, perhaps different view of the performance because my position in, in, the, in, in, the, in the 
theater was then decided upon these, these data. So, mm. But the problem is that then I have the feeling that I'm being monitored here and mm. I'm in a way performing and, mm. and, that, and, and the data that is extracted from me, of course, I have to give my consent to that because mm. otherwise I wouldn't be let in. Mm. So that there was this problem that I want to see the show. But price of that, mm -hmm. besides the ticket, is that I have to give away my data also mm -hmm. to them. So that, mm -hmm. that's like problematic because I'm kind of ready to give that data, but then on the other hand, I do not know what is then done with that, or what am I perhaps revealing from myself that I can control because mm -hmm. of course when you're still conducted and your movements are being monitored, mm -hmm. it's really a problematic way to behave in a way that mm. is like <laughs> feeling mm. as little as, as, key, as mm. possible or as much so that's something for me to decide or mm. perhaps not. So, so it's a kind of forced connectivity, yes. yeah. forced yeah. connectivity, which I think is part of what Martina was also talking mm. about, that yeah. it's not it's not it's no longer voluntary. I think you know the example that I. Think, funny. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the example that to me speaks the most of that is the one that I've mentioned several times already: the uh, the stock exchange, the the algorithmic stock exchange, and the, the fact that that is a real world system that we no longer fully comprehend, or that we no longer have fully control over, and that has uh, extremely uh, uh, concrete. Uh, Effects and implications. So I think that looking at that as a sort of um, this type of uh, dystopian uh, environment that you're describing, I think is actually I, I've been toying with the idea of doing a sort of postdoc project in in uh, in, in uh, finance finance capitalism because I find that that is is that you know in a certain way points to where uh, things can be going if things go very wrong in a way. Um, and I think there's something, it would be interesting to see how, um, how to sort of artistically try, uh, to, try to approach that, that type of network. Um, but I think it's an interesting idea that you bring. Uh, have you looked into like a psychology or neurosciences a lot? In about to algorithms that is there any studies on uh, how much uh, like human brains develop algorithms and <laughs> no. um, I haven't looked at it I haven't looked at it from that um, uh, that from specifically that perspective that how the human brain develops mm -hmm. algorithms I've um, I've recently become more interested in, or actually, you know, the whole time while um, researching algorithms, I've also been interested in this idea of how humans could enact algorithmic algorithms or algorithmic processes, mm -hmm. or how algorithms could be used to script performances, for example, mm -hmm. because they are, in a way, scripts. Um, and I was happy, because this has been sort of a thing that I've been interested in, but that I haven't, that's been kind of on the side of my work, or, or because of, the focus has been on, on computer algorithms, but I was happy that Mirko Kanno, who's here at the University of Arts and uh, in, in, in Sibelius Academy, has written about and talked about how um, in musical performance, uh, musicians are, in effect, 
um, enacting certain types of algorithms or algorithmic thinking processes. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and she uh, has this very interesting idea of how live performance, in live performance, what the audience ultimately um, gets, because the audience doesn't necessarily know the notes or the musical composition that's been uh, created beforehand, but they somehow sense the, the, the cognitive processing or the information processing of the performer and how the performer is doing that. And, and ultimately that, in a way, is, a, is, a, is an algorithmic process, or at least can be understood as an algorithmic process. And I think that's a very interesting, that's something also, you know, in addition to finance capitalism that I'd like to look into more, how, um, how to um, sort of uh, better understand uh, algorithms as part of live performance and on the other hand as part of sort of scripting performances. But I don't, from the sort of, I, have, you know, I haven't looked at much into neuroscience or psychology, but, but in, in the sense that the human brain would create algorithms, that I really can't say much about. Mm -hmm. Just thinking about, uh, like, for example, like teaching writing in, mm -hmm. and, and these like, concepts of, uh, that we are scripted in a way by, our, mm -hmm. by the way we have lived. Mm. And then we are we are scripted and programmed, and then we, when we start writing and mm. producing like plays or whatever text, then mm. they are like the products of the mm. products of these programs that we have. Yeah, we, yeah, are, we are programmed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's. Uh, I think that there's something interesting mm. that in regards to the uh, teaching dramaturgy, teaching writing. And yeah, there's a link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is interesting, I think. Yeah. And yeah, it's yeah. like this uh, old say that all the writers, they are always tell the same, sto same story or, the, or all their books are, in a way, about the same mm. things. Yeah. It's quite easy to think about it as, yeah. as, a, as a, some sort of a computer or a program that produces the same sort of results. Or, yeah. Every time in a little bit different form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think the key thing there is that, that this idea of the flexibility of of algorithms that they are changeable and mm. and, and, and and that um, it's not so rigid and mechanical mm. as you might think. You know, listening to that idea. Yeah. And also like grammatical models and schemes and. Mm. Yeah. Other questions or questions? If not, we will have a quick break and thank you also. Thank you.